wish I knew you like a friend. Maybe if I did, we come through in the end. Mm -mm. All the opportunities, all the hopes for you and me, stories far from proof. Stop trying to look for a fight with me, cause no one will win. I'm spending twice of the energy to watch you begin. Might be too soon. Seriously. Stop trying to...
check, check, check. Hey everyone, how's it going? Nice to see all of you again. It's Claire. We are back here at the 343 Labs YouTube channel again for some live looping stuff today. Thank you to everyone who's tuning in. Hi to uh, everyone in the chat so far. Big hi to Thomas who's managing stuff <laughs> for us as always. Hello also to uh, Mage Prometheus and Mick and Todd and Zenclef. Hi, nice to see all of you again. Uh, welcome back. Hope you're all having a great start to the week. I know for most of us, I guess it's, I guess it really depends on where you are in the world. It might be afternoon, might be morning, might be evening, wherever you are. It's 1 p.m. where we are or where most of 340 Labs uh, is so thanks to everyone who, who is tuning in um i'm pretty excited for today's topic as you know or actually let me just like backstep that a little bit i always get really ahead of myself because i always get super excited so my name's claire and i'm an instructor at 343 labs i'm an ableton certified trainer and that's what i mainly teach with 343 i also teach a lot in our youth academy program uh, over here at 343 we are mostly based in new york as well as in berlin so our uh, co-founder max who's holding the fort down in berlin started that um, er earlier this year and now we have two locations which is very cool we also do a lot of programming online too so that's what you're seeing here this is the monday show of 343 tv which is our daily live streaming programming show that we have and yeah, I host it. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Uh, I don't know about it, everyone else too, but at least today in New York, it is quite a cold day. I think the equivalent um, uh, uh, temperature, at least I, I usually think in Celsius just because I was brought up thinking about temperature in Celsius. So it's like 11 degrees today in Celsius. I think that's maybe 50 something or 60 something in Fahrenheit. Um, if someone could corroborate that, that would be amazing. But yeah, it's getting a little colder, but um, maybe some live looping action will get us up and running and get our brain juices flowing for a little bit more uh, mental warmth at least. So yeah, let's maybe take a second to speak about live looping and speak about doing this in general. It's live looping is probably one of my favorite parts about Ableton Live in general. Ooh, also just saw Scott. Hi. Hi Scott. How's it going? Um so yeah, I I think we oftentimes forget about or a lot of people forget this, I think, about how live is actually called live. I mean, we often term it Ableton, but Ableton's really the company. Live is the software. Sorry to everyone who's been tuning into my streams repeatedly because I probably I probably say that every time, I think, that I do a stream. But yeah, the, the original function of live or the, the original reason why it was created was really to facilitate a lot of live performance stuff. And looping was um, one of those things that it that live was able to do before a lot of other DAWs came up with it. Now there are other DAWs out there on the Marcus the the market, goodness, um, that, you know, do things like um the live looping situation too, or they call it like clip launching, stuff like that. So Bitwig and Logic immediately come to mind, especially with the Logic um recent update. And yeah, that's something to to keep in mind as if if you're interested in live looping and you want to explore different sorts of options. But I often think of live as my go-to for live looping because it sets it up in a couple of really interesting ways. So as usual, with all of my streams, I always ask for some suggestions from the chat. So in YouTube, uh, if anyone watching could give us a key as well as a BPM suggestion, that would be awesome. And I'm going to go ahead and get set up over here in live. So um, just to put things into a little bit of context, you can pretty much do live looping for anything that you want to loop in Ableton Live, any sounds that you want to do. One place that I think might be good to start off with is maybe just doing uh, a couple of MIDI tracks and get us up and running, maybe thinking about the core parts of a music production. So I'm going to go ahead here, and I already have one empty MIDI track up, so maybe I'll just uh, name it drums. Uh, maybe I'll create a new one where we can put some bass on it, and I'll also recolor these um, depending on how I usually color code them. I usually think of drums being like brown or orange and bass is usually blue. Um, maybe we'll also do some chordal stuff or some kind of pad thing. Uh, usually I think of that as purple. And then melody usually comes in as like uh, either pink or green, depending on exactly what it is. Let's save the audio track for the green since it's already audio. And uh, yeah, let's do like a melody thing and maybe we can do some live audio input later that'll be fun as well um cool uh thanks 
Mick for the suggest. I, I knew you said BD Mick. I'm not sure what. I'm not sure, not sure if that means B flat, but maybe let's do B. So let's do like a thing in B minor. And if anyone else has a tempo suggestion, that would be um, very cool. So let's do something in B minor. That sounds great. And maybe we'll, we could even start off there with some kind of uh, chord progression in B minor. So I'm going to go ahead and double click in the chords track over here. Let's make this a four bar loop. I'm doing this by increasing the length over here in the clip view. Uh, on the lower left hand side, there's a little box over here that lets you increase the loop length. By default, it's usually about one bar, but you can always change that. So now that we've got this empty MIDI clip, let's go ahead and um, also uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's do this first. This is one way of doing the live looping thing. There's a, a couple of ways I want to show you. So this is the first way. Let's go ahead and put up some kind of sound, you know, what? and let's even make it fairly straightforward. Maybe we can just grab a um, an electric piano type of sound. So I have one of my favorite ones is called EP Faceplant. I think I even have it saved to my favorites. Yeah, I do. So let's click and drag. It's on the chords now. Uh, and for the purposes of today's um, stream, there are many ways that you can input MIDI if you want to do something related to live looping. I'm going to be using my MIDI keyboard over here, which is the Akai MPK Mini. And let's go ahead and first of all, make sure that it is set up. <laughs> so let's head over into our preferences in live. That's going to be command comma or control comma, depending if you're on a PC or a Mac. Great. Cool. So it's being detected. And now I should be able to head over here, arm the track and play some chords. Maybe, maybe not. Ooh. I was having this issue earlier on, which may, it might just be like a flub, but it could also very well be me. So let's go ahead and reconnect stuff. Should be showing up in a little bit. Yeah, there it is. Okay, cool. So let's do, yeah, there we go. It was a, it was a flub, truly. <laughs> cool. Um, Mage, thank you for the 128. Let's do the 128. And uh, cool. Uh, yeah, no problem, Mick. Let's do, let's do B minor, actually. Let's just stick with B minor. So we'll do B minor at 128. Let's put on the metronome in live because one thing that is really useful for live looping is being able to keep time of something. So oftentimes the premise of live looping involves being able to uh, keep something playing continuously while layering things on top of it too. So while layering other sounds. So for example, maybe the quintessential kind of thing that comes to mind when people talk about looping is maybe doing like stacks of vocals. If you're ever doing some kind of vocal looping thing, you see acapella groups or you see um, even beatboxers. A lot of beatboxers do this as well. They use some kind of pedal and you loop that. And speaking of pedals, another thing is guitar looping. That's also super common too. Uh, and there may even be a, an effect or a device in live that we take a look at later that kind of emulates that too. But over here uh, in, in live, the great part about looping here is that we get independent control over all of the layers. And that's why we can do something like loop different types of sounds, not just the same guitar patch, for example, but different parts. And, and you can kind of all do this in real time. But because of that, because we want to stay in time, it's usually pretty important to turn on the metronome and also adjust the metronome volume appropriately. So I'm going to play it out and I'm also going to adjust the volume which I'll do by clicking in the master track on the right hand side and there is a little blue knob that lets you control the cue volume or the metronome volume. So here we go. Cool. So we got that. Now there's kind of like a couple of ways that you can do live looping, like I mentioned. One of the ways which people um, sometimes overlook a lot is actually to pre-create an empty MIDI track and then directly loop into that. Um, and you know what, maybe I might even save that for drums. Let's do the most obvious way first. I was like, again, getting very <laughs> excited about things and moving on super quickly. But let's say we wanted to do some kind of chord progression, maybe a simple, um, let's do like a B minor, and then let's do like a, a four, five, six type of thing, or a, a really a one flat seven, flat six type thing. So here we go, let's turn on the metronome. Now what I'm gonna do is uh, demonstrate this first and then maybe explain what I just did and then redo it again for everyone. So check this out, over here I'm in the chords track. Uh, to start recording my loop, I'm going to click on this circular button. Generally, any time that you click on a circle in Ableton Live, it means to record something. It's also worth noting that when you're using a MIDI track, the circle 
buttons, or actually no, even in an audio track too. When you're using any track and you want to record a loop into it, you will only get the circle record buttons if you've armed the track. So if you don't arm the track, you're not going to get those. But let's arm the track first. That's why we did that first. <laughs> and now we can go ahead and record a loop. I'm also going to go ahead and turn on the metronome. Here we go. So we got this going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Let's turn the metronome off. There's the loop. <laughs> we can double click on the clip to check out the notes we have. There we go. Nice. Well, I was quite fortunate that my timing wasn't too bad. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, but that's kind of essentially how you would do live looping. There's a series of steps, right? So the first step that I did was I listened. I think that's one thing that people often forget when we're live looping, it's like, we want to make sure things are in time. So got to listen, got to listen to some kind of tempo reference. And then when I was ready to start recording my loop, I pressed on the circle button inside the clip, which means again, to record something. And I recorded my chord progression. Now, right before I ended the I ended the loop that I wanted to record, I made sure to press the record button again. And that means that I can then stop the loop. So that's something to keep in mind because I think a lot of people also get a little confused with how these things are running in time. So let me just take a moment to head over here into the clip um, section. Let's take a listen one more time to this with the metronome on and let's listen and then we'll talk about it. Cool. So again, pretty simple steps as far as like the actual instructions go. When you're ready to record a loop, you press the circular button, the loop starts playing. When you're done recording the loop, you can press on the same uh, clip slots button again, although it would turn into like a red triangle. So what exactly do I mean by this? Check this out. When I'm not going to record something this time, I'm just going to click on the record slot over here and see what happens. So here we go. Originally a circle. Now it has just turned into a red triangle and the red triangle means that this clip slot is ready to accept any kind of MIDI information. So oh, there we go. Now, when I'm done recording, I can click on the red triangle and it'll then be ready to loop again. So that's, that's essentially how this works. Now you may have noticed something that I did point out just now too, is that I made sure to press that red triangle to indicate that I wanted to stop the loop before I actually finished playing my chord, before that ended. And that's because of the way time runs in Ableton Live. Generally, when we're dealing with time, we're dealing with a number of bars and beats. So if I turn the metronome back on again, so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, Four. In this case, I had four bars, so I had four units of four beats. So I had one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Now, in order for my loop to have properly looped, I need to have pressed the stop loop button within that last bar because of the way live is currently set up. Live is usually set up by default to something that we call a one bar launch quantization. And that means that any type of clip that you play or that you record is always going to snap to the nearest, uh, to snap to the following bar, not the nearest bar, the following bar after that. That means if you give live a direction uh, within the time span of say, bar two over here. That means it is going to make this a two bar loop. If you wanted to make this a four bar loop, like I just did, I would have to give the, I would have to give live the clip slot, some kind of command within bar four. If I had done that too late, I would have probably recorded a five bar loop instead. So you know what? Let's actually go for that now. Let's purposely record something a little bit too late and I'll show you exactly what I mean. So here we go. We got the metronome. Let's do some, ooh, let's do some melodic stuff. So I'll turn off the metronome while I find some kind of melody sound. Let's go and head over to instruments. Maybe let's do something from analog since we just did like electric. So let's do analog. Maybe we got some kind of uh, mallet sounds. I'm always a big fan of mallets. Cool, great. So I'm gonna also unarm the chords track and rearm the, the melody track. And this is gonna be a really great example of what happens when live looping 
not goes wrong, but maybe goes unexpectedly. So if you if you issue like a late command to live and you're not able to sync things up. So here's our chord progression with our metronome. Let's record some melody. Cool. Cool. Let's, I think I, let, let's just mosey around B minor. Cool. That was late. So notice what's happening over here. I have a four bar chord loop, but because I pressed too late, I actually pressed directly on the end of the, the fourth bar, which probably lined up honestly more of the start of the fifth bar. I end up having a five bar loop inside um, this clip slot over here. So there's a couple of ways to kind of go about doing this. If you're in a live setting, probably the best way to, to counter this is to just record the whole thing over again. Do it again. No problem doing it again. I think that's really fun about live looping. You can always redo things if you make a mistake. Uh, if you're doing something in like a more post-production-y sort of sense, you can always have the option of readjusting the loop length um, within live itself. And then when you relaunch the entire scene, it'll all be synced up. And it'll loop back every four bars. So that's one way to think about it. Um, and that's why we need to be so careful <laughs> about all of these things. People often, um, I think when I, I teach my students live looping, especially from the lens of performance and not so much like thinking of different kinds of ideas, they always panic if they launch things too quickly. So my usual recommendation is to just count things out. Um, and so I'll demonstrate that now when, when I'm thinking about like different types of, of ways that I'm going to manage how I'm executing my loop. So let's go ahead and record this in with the um, with the normal looping stuff that we do. Here is, here we go. Let's re wait one more cycle. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, let's go. Two, three, four. So I need to press the loop button between two, three, and four of the last bar in within any time span over there to get it to loop properly. Yeah! <laughs> Amazing. So that's one way that we can start uh, working with these things. Cool, I see a couple of, of things uh, coming in into question. Hi, greetings to Sam, who looks like he just joined. And they just joined. Uh, Sonia, hi, nice to see you again. <laughs> I love the, the waving smiley. Can't you change it in the box? in the left upper hand corner. Yes, you can do that, Sam. So as I mentioned, this is something that's called launch quantization. By default, launch quantization is set to one bar in live. So that's why you wanna be careful. Why would we not do launch quantization? That's an excellent question that maybe you are asking and that a lot of students also ask as well. Here's a really great example with what happens if we turn off launch quantization. So let's turn it off. Now let's go ahead and maybe add on a bass part. That might be exciting to try some things without launch quantization. So let's go ahead here, pick an, a nice bass. Ooh, that's, that's cool. Actually, no, this antidote bass is pretty nice. Let's pull that up. Cool. So let's go ahead and unarm the melody track now that we've got that. We'll, we'll head back to it later because um, there's something I want to address with maybe a few of the parts that are going a little wonky. But let's get the bass up over here. So now we should have some kind of bass sound if I'm in a low enough octave. Ooh. It's also very <laughs> reverberant. So let me just decrease the reverb on that slightly. Cool, let's just do that. Um, yeah, so now we have this set to no launch quantization. Let's see what happens. Exciting. Here we go. That was a bad example because I actually did it very well. <laughs> my timing, my timing was actually pretty good. So I'll, I'll try to try to mess up a little bit more this time. Thank you for bearing with me. Cool. Here we go. Cool. 
Again, that was pretty good. <laughs> okay. Oh dear. I feel like once you do a lot of live looping, it's really hard to, to purposefully mess up. But that said, we can visually see this, right? So a couple of things that you might notice. Uh, you might notice, first of all, that the start of this loop doesn't actually line up with the beginning of the bar because the rhythm that I wanted to play was one. It was starting on the one, right? So da, 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 da. So uh, it should have been on the downbeat, but in this case, it's actually closer to the third beat of this loop. Another telltale sign is over here. If you check the loop length itself, it's three, three, and then a kind of like pink shaded three. That usually means that the near the end of the actual loop or the length of this loop isn't snapping to a direct division of the of the grid in live. So that's why it's probably not good to do live looping with no quantization, no launch quantization, unless you're doing a specific type of ambient piece, which is something I do as well. Um, that's when I would have this set to none. But for now, let's set it to something. <laughs> let's set it to one bar. I think that might be particularly useful. And let's try this again. Here we go. Two, three, four. Turn the metronome off. There we go. Our parts are very nice. Now, here's something that we can kind of think of a little bit. Um, usually when you are doing some kind of live looping thing, especially if it's in a very fast type of performance, generally it works better if you have all the parts pretty locked into time. And that's where something called record quantization comes into play. So this is something that you can access in the edit menu of, of Ableton Live. But before I even go into the edit menu and show you, let's take a quick look and even a quick listen to specifically the bass and the melody parts. Um, and I want to play it without the metronome and then I'll play it with the metronome and we'll see if we can hear a couple of things. So here we go. Here's without. So it actually sounds okay. All right, without the metronome, but when I turn this on, especially in the very first bar with the counterpoint between the melody and the bass, you can hear that some of the timing's a little bit off. So of course, one way that you can kind of go about doing this is let's say you already recorded this melody loop. You can of course select all the notes by pressing inside the MIDI note editor and then doing command A or control A. And then you can always do command U or control U to be able to quantize these. So now you'll get this. Cool. So that's quantization after the fact. But what if we want it to be quantized going into live? So let's go ahead and re-record the bass stuff, but with record quantization. So we can do this again in the edit menu. In live, there is a drop down section that says record quantization, and you can choose the division that you want to quantize to. So in this case, maybe I'll do um, 16th notes. That's usually what I tend to leave it to if I do use record quantization. Um, so let's go ahead and try this out one more time. Here we go. Here's the bass part. Nice. Locked in. Great. So now we got all of these parts going well. Uh, now here's a, a cool feature about um, the, the stuff that you can do inside um, session view that involves like pre-made drum clips. And actually before I do that, I'm also going to head over into the chat one more time. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, Mage, I just saw your question. Can you program a foot switch to send the command? So it really depends. Um, and, and maybe we need to be a little bit more specific about this. So Mage, uh, if you know the answer to this question, um, and, and maybe this is, is Sam, Samuel kind of half answered the question. So I do want to make sure that I'm fully answering your question. Mage, if you could let me know in the chat, what kind of type of message do you think a foot switch might be sending to Ableton Live? Like if you, if you connected it to your computer or some kind of uh, device and you were using that foot switch, what kind of message do you think it would be sending to Ableton Live? Better still, is there a foot switch that you have in mind? So let me know in the chat and we'll get back to that in a little bit.
Now over here, let's head over into the drums uh, with the thing that I mentioned just now, yay, <laughs> um, that, I, that I usually get very excited about, which is the overdub functions. The session record button in live is like super underutilized. Let's go ahead and create a new MIDI clip here by double clicking in this drum uh, clip slot. Let's also go over into the uh, categories. And since we had the really lovely suggestion of 128, um, let's go ahead and do something maybe a little housey. So let's pull up a 909 kit for that. And maybe let's do the 909 flavor kit. I remember that being kind of cool. Sure, why not? So clicking and dragging it onto the drum uh, track. And now if I go into a low enough octave, ooh, and I unarm <laughs> the bass track and rearm the drum track. Yeah, there we go. Those are all my drum sounds. Um, so then I can start layering things on. This is something that you can do with the session record button over here. So let's go ahead and play this first. Cool. So now what I've got over here is I've got this entire scene that's going on. I've got my drums, which are currently empty, and then I've got my bass, my chords, and my melody. So what I'm gonna do instead of recording from scratch is I'm gonna say, okay, I just want a one bar loop for this drum at the moment. So what I did is I double clicked in an empty clip slot to put that in. And now I'm gonna make use of this button over here on the top. This is the, the circle, again, circle being our friendly record button shape. I'm gonna use this button that's called the session record button. That's gonna let me overdub into an existing clip. So this is really cool if you wanna kind of program a type of live set or a live looping set that's extremely structured, you can go ahead and create uh, pre-made lengths of clips inside live in session view, and then you can just record into them. You don't actually have to press the stop and start. Instead, the commands that you issue will be record and end record. So overdub and, and end overdub in that sense. Let's see exactly what I mean by this. I'm gonna just demonstrate by doing like a maybe a four on the floor kick at the moment. So let's go ahead and get this started. I'm gonna make the parts a little softer so you can hear me speak over. Cool. So now let's press that empty circle button. And you'll notice that the drum clip is now a red triangle. And red triangle means ready to receive information. So we're good to go. Let's see what we can do with some kick drum stuff. One, two, three, go. Let's end the overdubbing. Green triangle, playing back, but not overdubbing. Let's overdub some more. Again, session record button. Let's do like a clap. Maybe let's find a hat. There we go. Yeah, launch an empty scene to stop everything. Woo, <laughs> there we go. There's a live looping stuff. So I love using the, the session overdub button so much. Um, and that, yeah, that's like probably one of my favorite parts. I'm going to head back over here into, um, this little over here. Uh, yeah, mage looks like I didn't get an answer from, uh, from you. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and tell people about it then. So here's something to consider everyone. Usually when we're doing a lot of live looping stuff, especially if you are a performer who uses your hands a lot, it might be really useful to have some kind of controller with you. So that's what this is right here. I've got my MPK mini, um, and I use this quite often to do a series of looping stuff, but this is even beyond the entire foot switch situation with sustained pedals. Cause it's one thing to tell you to use a piece of equipment, but it's, an it's another thing to really understand what's going on. And that's because any kind of MIDI controller as well as some kind of pedal. So it could be either a sustain pedal or it could be some kind of other, it could be a, like an expression pedal, which is a different sort of pedal too. The thing that all of these things have in common, all of these items, doesn't matter if they're used by your foot or used by your elbow or used by your armpit. Um, all of these, I've done that before. All of these are sending MIDI messages and that's what's important. 
because we can then do MIDI mapping. So let's say I want it to, you know, continue adding on to my drums over here. And let's say I want it to use some kind of message issued by one of these things on my MIDI controller to be able to let me overdub things and to turn that overdub button on. That's where the power of MIDI mapping really comes in. Um, and that's something that is being sent out by a foot switch It's or a foot pedal in this case. If you're using a sustain pedal, that can actually be different from a foot switch. So you just want to be careful of the terminology itself. But usually when you're sending, when you're using a sustain pedal, you're sending out something that's called CC64, which is a type of control change signal as a MIDI message. We can do the same thing here. Uh, maybe not with a pedal. Maybe we can use one of the pads. That might be a little bit more appropriate because a pedal is variable. So you want to be a bit careful with that too. Let's go ahead and head into MIDI mapping mode. And let's map the overdub button to this pad that I have over here. So I'll, I'll walk you through that again one more time. I go through this in a couple of my several other streams too. I'm going to undo that. To map anything inside Ableton Live means to connect it or build some kind of bridge between the software and the hardware. So in this case, I've already made the decision. I want this pad to control that overdub button. So I'm saying, okay, let's click on that overdub button in Live and then I'm going to click on the pad that I want to map and assign to it. So there's the pad, and now we can see, okay, it's showing up over here in the left-hand side of live. Now I can exit MIDI mapping mode, and that button is going to help me turn on and off the session record. So to demonstrate this, let's launch the entire scene again. Rebalance some things so you can hear me. And now when I press this pad, you can see that the session record button is in red. And when I press it again, it's toggled off. So it's acting as a toggle on and off. That's useful, right? Because I can maybe add on a few more things. Let's see what else we can do. Cool. So we got some kicks there. What other sounds do we have? Maybe a crash. That could be fun. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll just do like a, a crash type of, of thing. So let's overdub this. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I accidentally did the snare instead. That's fine. You can see that it's been overdubbed. Cool. Cool. So now I can go ahead and take these away. And yeah, that's essentially what you would be able to, to use it for. So that's something that a foot switch could also do or some kind of foot controller. You just want to be careful of when you do that though. Because let's say you're you if you're a pianist like me, um, then what I often do when I'm using any kind of keyboard controller is when I'm playing the piano or even when I'm playing push, I actually like using that uh, to specifically do sustain. That's a, a, something that you would usually do when you are playing some kind of keyboard and you want to maybe send the sound out longer. So the moment you map it to something, you're not going to be able to use it. And you might also get some um, conflicts depending on what kind of software you're using. So you just want to be a little bit mindful of that. And in this case, we're able to kind of, you know, get away from it by doing some MIDI mapping stuff. But yeah, that's pretty much what's happening. I know we're at the halfway point of the stream. <laughs> so I'm going to head over into the chat and see what's going on. And maybe also drink some coffee. Ooh. Totally. Um, so let's see. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Mage. Yes, a sustain pedal. Absolutely. CC64 or a keypad on the keyboard. Easy to program a control to send a CC, but can live automatically route it to the armed track? So that's a really great question. And this is maybe something that not just goes beyond the scope of live, but uh, or that does go beyond the scope of live and is more broadly addressing the idea of MIDI and what it means to do some MIDI programming stuff. So Mage, since you already know that it's, yes, CC64, then maybe the next question that we ask ask is, okay, we know the type of message. Now, what channel is it sending on? So here's something to, to kind of keep in mind. Any Anytime you use a MIDI controller, it's usually sending on one of 16, or actually even perhaps all of them, MIDI channels. And that's really what we see over here inside the settings for each of these individual um, clips that, uh, tracks that you see over here. You've got MIDI from something, and then you've got all channels. That's what it means. So it means that the track this particular track, since it's armed, the drums, it's ready to receive MIDI from pretty much anywhere. So because of that, I'm able to, I, I could, if I wanted to, say, maybe have 
different parts of my keyboard or different kinds of my controllers send on different MIDI channels and have them trigger different independent things. And that's something that you can see in the MIDI mapping too, because that's actually what I did with my controller. So if I hit into MIDI mapping mode, all the way here on the left, you can see a tiny number that says two, and that's because my pads at the moment are all on MIDI channel two. This is good because I can still use, um, you'll notice a couple of things. Let's take a step back again. When I'm looking at this MIDI mapping box over here on the left, I'm presented with different kinds of information, right? I've got my channel number, I've got the note or control, and then I've got the path that it's controlling, which is in this case, the session record. That's the specific part of transport that it's recording, that it's controlling. So um, just to kind of put things into perspective a little bit more, if I mapped some other kind of control to, um, yeah, to my keyboard, you will see that it's not on MIDI channel two, but it's actually on MIDI channel one. So for example, my key bid over here is MIDI channel one. And now this is dangerous. Why? When I exit MIDI mapping mode, let's say I was playing something over here, playing all my drums, la 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 la. And then I wanted to play this low note, but I, I went ahead and pressed that. Now that button that I, that I pressed was mapped to the play button. <laughs> so I'm no longer able to play this note, but now every time I try to, it's gonna start transport. So that's just sharing that because it's a, bit a sad road that I've gone down before mapping everything and then being like, wait, it's on the same MIDI channel as I'm playing on. So let's go ahead and undo that because we don't want to do that. Let's save, um, let's save channel two for the, the mapping stuff that we're doing. But yeah, that's kind of like the, the live looping situation that we're dealing with over here. Um, so I would say as far as easiness goes, the method itself is straightforward, but maybe what is less easy, Mage, to, to address your question is the understanding behind it. But once you understand stuff, you will know how to do absolutely everything in live. So that's the benefit of going a little bit deeper than just really understanding like a surface level of what these things are doing. Um, so, oh, Musictron, hello, greetings. Is there a way to use Sonarworks in Live? Because Ableton is the, the company and Live is the software. Is there a way to use Sonarworks in Live and route the click or metronome of Live to the master track? Oh yeah, you use Live, that's great. Um, the click or metronome of Live to the master track so the click and the browser preview gets affected. That's a great question. I don't uh, use Sonarworks, so unfortunately I'm not able to answer that. But that said, you can absolutely set out a different click. So this is something that I also did want to cover for live looping stuff anyway. So it's pro probably a really good segue as well. But uh, one thing you might have noticed, everyone, is that while I was recording, I made a point to emphasize how important the metronome is, but that's not something that you necessarily want to hear whenever you're doing this. So something that I usually recommend is setting up a separate cue for yourself whenever you are listening to some kind of click in your ears and you're not actually wanting to share it with the rest of your audience. So that's something that is pretty important to a lot of the design elements of live looping as far as like set design goes. And that's maybe something that I prize a lot maybe just by nature of the fact that I'm a live experience designer. So I do this a lot for clients. I do this a lot for the artists that I work with. We want to be able to set up some kind of cue. So the great part about being able to do this is that it's very straightforward in live provided you have the right kind of hardware for it. So usually anytime you set up any kind of cue or any kind of separate mix, you will need some type of audio interface that's not your internal sound card. So in this case, if I open up my preferences, you will be able to see that I have my interface selected, which is the duet. And if I go into my output configuration, you can even see that, yes, I do have separate stereo outs. I have a pair of one, two stereo outs that are my main outs, and then I have three, four as well. If I have these enabled, I can click out of preferences, and I will then have the option of sending my cue to a separate um, place. So this means that now, if I play this back with the metronome, we won't hear the metronome. Metronome's not there. That's because I'm going to stop all these clips. I'm going to be silent for a second. Check out the levels of the cue out. You can actually kind of see that it is the metronome and it's going at a regular rate. So metronome is going out of a separate output now. It's not going to anywhere because I don't have anything set up. But if I want to hear the metronome again, I can send it back to one, two. So that's something you might want to consider. We're not going to go super in depth into audio routing. Maybe that's its own little um, 
little stream. If you would like a stream on audio routing, let us know in the chat. Maybe we can arrange for something like that in the future. Um, that might be kind of cool to, to try doing. So, so let me know if, if you want that because the next couple of streams, just as a heads up, everyone are going to be a bit more focused on some basic techniques for live performance. So that's why live looping is one of them, which is pretty cool. And um, yeah, that's essentially the main part of looping in session view. Now, kind of going back to something that I mentioned just now, this really starts getting a little bit more interesting when we're dealing with audio. And in terms of audio, you won't really have a lot of overdubbing necessarily to do in, in tracks, um, but maybe there's a lot of sequential types of loops that you want to build out. And what exactly do I mean by that? I'll show you in a moment. So now that we've got these, let's set some kind of something up for maybe vocal looping, and we'll also set it up as maybe three stacks of harmonies. So I'm going to go ahead and do uh, rename this track Vokes 1. And then what I'm going to do is set up two additional tracks, but they're going to be all programmed a little bit differently for a number of reasons. So I'm going to set this up. Let's do Vokes 1. Let's make sure that I have my monitoring set to auto on the track. And I have this track record arm. Now I'm going to I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna temporarily leave it armed. I'm, I'm sounding a little bit louder, so I'll back away from my mic a little. But what I do wanna do is optimize this a little bit, maybe with some effects that I've prepared. So I have this like thing that I've, I made myself that's like just an EQ and compression thing. You can totally do this on your own too. Um, but let's go ahead and cut out some of the lows over here as well as compress my voice. And now it's gonna be louder. So I'll maybe mute the monitoring. And I'm here, great. So now I'm coming in on my vocal track. You can hear me over here. Let's also put a little bit of global um, reverb and delay through these sends. So here we go. Here's some delay. Got a quarter note delay happening. I can show my returns as well. You can see them. Cool. So now that I've got that set up, I just unarmed it so that you can hear me normally again. I'm also going to unarm the, the drums track. But this is a live looping setup that I like to do a lot for audio stuff. So let's go ahead and create a new audio track. But instead of taking the audio in from an external microphone, I'm going to take it from the original track. So from Vox 1. And you'll see why in a second. So I'm just going to call this Vox 2. I'll make a, a duplicate of it and I'll call that Vox 3 also. Color all of these green so that we can stay organized. Great. So these darker green ones are going to be like my loops. Now for these, what I want to do is route them a little differently, but just to establish that we are able to do vocal looping, let's go ahead and arm this track and let's do some vocal looping with all of this. And get my drums up a little and bass. Cool. Let's do like a two bar thing. That might be good enough. My voice back, cool. So that's how you would do like a normal vocal loop type of situation. You would make sure that you have the track armed and then you would loop that. The next part that I'm gonna show you is a technique that I like using a lot for vocal looping, which is maybe a little different from traditional vocal looping stuff. I go super in depth into this in one of my breakdown videos on the 343 Labs YouTube channel about um, a piece that I did called Skylark, which was a, a flip of the original jazz standard. If anyone does jazz stuff, maybe you've heard of the tune. It's one of my favorite um, standards, so I love it a lot. But let's head back over here. So I'm going to temporarily bring this um, original loop maybe further down. I'll deactivate it for now by pressing zero, and that'll temporarily deactivate it, but keep it over there. Now I'm going to do the routing stuff. So on my track number two and track four that I have over here for Vokes two and uh, track three, goodness, <laughs> uh, Vokes two and three, I'm going to set them to, I'm going to select them both, and then we'll do audio from Vox 1, and we'll do it post FX. We will also keep the monitoring off, and we will arm the both of them. Why? This is so that when I record loops into here, what's actually happening? Instead of taking the audio directly from my mic, 
I'm able to take the processed audio from this vox track over here, the original vocal track. So the original vocal track has some EQ and some compression on it. Those are going to be baked into the audio that you record into here. And that can be really useful if you're doing some kind of looping situation in a live set that involves, for example, a lot of, um, how to put it, maybe a lot of, uh, of layers and a lot of devices, and you want to kind of minimize the number of devices that you're using overall. So these tracks wouldn't need the same EQ and compression train, chain. They would just be able to, to go, go about as they pleased. So I would just have to match the sends and returns. And let's do some vocal looping stuff. So let me just... Do this one more time, switch over. Cool. So here is my voice. It's going to I'm <laughs> temporarily disable the, the sense. Um, so what's going to happen is I will record, but instead of pressing the clip slot in the clip slots in the Vox 1 track, I'm going to do the reverse. So I'm going to go back and do Vox 3 and Vox 2. And you know what? Let's just set up one more. Let's do Vox 4 because then I'll, it'll illustrate what I usually do with this type of setup. Now, you might also notice that um, something I didn't mention just now, or didn't elaborate on rather, was that I set the monitoring to off in these three tracks, and that means that I'm not going to hear anything that's coming in from the track. Because what happens if I have all of these to auto? Now you hear like four of me. So I want to make sure that's set to off so that you only hear one of me, the original Claire. <laughs> and now in this track, I'm going to mainly set this as like my main vocal track. So maybe I'm doing, you know, some lead vocal stuff with it, so on and so forth. But then my loops are gonna go over here in the other tracks. So let's see what we can do with this. Let's see if we can make this happen. Make the other tracks louder too. So it's around comparable volume. Here we go. So let's pretend that I'm singing a song and I've got these lovely backing vocals. <laughs> so yeah, that can work really well. Let's bring this down. Great. So you can hear that the backing vocals are going. My voice is still here. So this is great. It's a great type of routing because it lets you do the looping stuff, but it, if you need to be heard as like a clean vocal or maybe some clean line, line on your guitar or something like that, this is a really great way of routing all of that so that you have the process stuff, but you'll also be able to still continuously use the same track and the same live input to keep talking over stuff. Um, and I'm going to stop this for now, but that's just one. I also just want to iterate that that's one way of doing things. There's so many ways of, of doing live looping things in live, which is the beauty of it really. Um, and, and a great example of this is if you've ever looked at some people and their live setups, another way of doing the routing is to just have two separate mics. So you have one mic that's like dedicated to the looping stuff and maybe it has some special effects attached to it. Maybe there are specific things mapped to that as well. Um, and the other, and then you have like your own separate mic that's just for the live input. So there's different ways of controlling all of these elements. Um, oftentimes also, whenever you're using a controller that is has deeper integration with live. So for example, if it's got an Ableton control script, an example of this is the push. Another really great example is the APC40. You won't have to do any kinds of manual mapping if you want to control loops. What exactly do I mean by this? If I wanted to do redo the vocal looping stuff that I just did, one way I, that I could do this is with um, my MPK Mini. So maybe even using the same ideas that we had just now of mapping. Let's go into MIDI mapping mode and let's redo the vocal loops, except this time I'll loop almost continuously by pressing on each of the pads that I mapped to them. So let's map this to that pad um, and that and that. So I got these three pads on my MPK Mini. Show, uh, not show, uh, 
stand for that connection between what I'm doing here and what I'm asking live to do. So let's exit and let's do all of this again. I probably don't need the metronome this time, so let's see how this works. Make all of these louder because I brought their volumes down. Cool. Uh, and you notice that I did that pretty quickly. I kind of did that like one after the other. And to be very frank, that takes a lot of practice. It took me so long to get that right. I feel like another thing that we think of a lot is like, um, wow, it looks so easy. Uh, when the answer to it is practice, <laughs> um, and and practice makes things better. I, I, I know we always throw around the, there's like a very common saying, practice makes perfect. I usually try to think practice makes proficient because I think that, and this is real. you know, you can argue with me about this. I'm totally open to taking arguments, but I think like um, pretty much anything in the world, if you're really interested in learning it and interested in getting to know it, by doing repetitions and by practicing something, you can get a lot better at it. It's kind of like exercise and it's like, uh, you know, music making as well, the more you do it. Um, kind of the same thing also as like doing the dishes. Like after a while, it's like you don't even think of, wait, I actually need to put soap on before I start using a sponge and stuff like that. Um, so after a while, you just get really proficient at it. And you won't, you won't, I don't think you'll ever be perfect at anything really, but you can get fairly close if you practice a lot. And it's, it's, you know, the idea of muscle memory also comes, comes to mind. So yeah, that's kind of like the ins and outs of live looping everyone. Not really ins and outs, really. I'd rather I should rephrase that. The ins and outs of the basics of live looping. <laughs> There's a lot of other stuff that you could do with it too. Um, I, I didn't even have enough time to go into Looper. Uh, I'll just show you what Looper is though, uh, just to make sure that I've included it. Maybe that could be a separate stream on its own too. But if you go into the audio effects category in live, you have this audio effect that's called Looper. And yeah, I was, uh, I think I was messing with it uh, either yesterday or, or the day before. I use this quite often too. The great part about Looper is that instead of um, you looping to a tempo, so in this case, listening to the click, Looper is able to kind of detect your tempo. So let's see if I can maybe uh, illustrate this with Looper. We'll see if it works. I'm gonna click Looper and drag and drop it onto my existing vocal track, which is the one that you hear here. And it's over here. It looks a little like this. And if anyone's seen guitar looping before or done guitar looping before, this kind of emulates that. That was a lot of the background with why Looper was created. And without going into too much detail, the main part I want to illustrate about Looper is that tempo following situation. So I'm going to do the same thing that I did with the normal live looping in, in live. I'm going to click on this giant record button in Looper and then I'll press stop to stop a loop. And maybe I'll just um, say some words this time. So here is an iteration of Looper. Let's make stuff loop. Here is an iteration of Great. Looper. Let's make stuff loop. Here is an iteration of Looper. Great, so you can hear that. Let's make stuff loop. Here is an iteration of Looper. Great, so you can hear that. Let's make I'm stuff loop. I'm overdubbing. Here is an iteration of Looper. Great, so you can hear that. Let's make I'm stuff overdubbing. loop. I'm <laughs> overdubbing. Here is... Cool, so you could kind of hear how all of those layers were building up. You might also notice that now our tempo is no longer 128. We are at 105.2. And that's the tempo that was detected by Looper between the first time that I pressed that record button and the next time that I pressed it again, which put it into overdub mode. So that's something to, that you can experiment with a little bit in Looper, which I also really enjoy too. Um, and yeah, uh, Rio, hi, hello again. How to combine live looping and record looping in live. So Rio, if you just joined, you probably missed the first half of the stream. So if you head back to the first part of the stream, all your answers will probably be answered. So you can go ahead and um, take a, a, you can rewatch the stream as well. Uh, Todd, so is the processing from Vox1 permanently printed onto the backing tracks? Yep, absolutely. That's what I said when I first instantiated them. So the um, I mentioned that the EQ and compressor, since they were both directly on the track as inserts, would be baked into the vocal track. So yep, exactly as I mentioned, they will be permanently printed into the vocal tracks. So if you don't want them to be printed, then you don't have to use this method. Or you could also set these to pre-FX, and then you will get the print the pre 
EQ and compressor recordings if you wanted to still treat them. The reason why I take them post effects is so that I don't have to have this same chain of vocal stuff on every single track that I'm doing. And that's because sometimes for my vocal looping, I don't just have an EQ and compressor. I have things like chorusing. I have things like octave doubling. I have things like flanging or other kinds of creative effects that are quintessential to the vocal sound of that piece. And I want to make sure that it's on every track without having to have the same chain of, say, like five or six devices on every track, because that ultimately does add to the CPU as well. One more thing I want to add about Looper that I think is pretty cool is that if you ever decide that you want to take some sound out of Looper into the real world, whatever that might mean, um, you can always click on this button over here that says drag me. <laughs> and if you drag this, it's going to pull up a new audio clip of whatever you just looped. So let's take a listen to this over here. Here is an iteration of Great, Looper. Great, so you can hear that. Let's make I'm stuff overdubbing. Loop. Here is an iteration of Looper. Great, so you can hear that. Let's make I'm stuff over oh, So you got all of that in in a particular in one particular clip, which is pretty useful. So I like that part about Looper a lot. You won't, won't be able to parse out the layers, but this can be really cool if you ever do anything related to like resampling or um, different kinds of sample based processing that you want to do specific to an audio clip. So it can be really great to do that. Um, Ooh, except, uh, hello, greetings, uh, maybe it's your first time here. Uh, can I get Ableton Live on a 2012 MacBook Pro? That's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but it could very well be answered by a quick Google search. So if you quickly Google um, Ableton Live compatibility, that's a term that you can search up. You can go ahead and take a look at some official information that's provided by the Ableton people from the company itself. So they've done a really great document on their uh, online help page that speaks about compatibility between specific computer systems and operating systems, as well as the corresponding software versions of Live. So for example, Live 10 might be compatible with certain kinds of softwares and operating systems and PCs or Macs or regardless of what you're doing, but maybe Live 9 is incompatible with that same operating system. So it depends on the type of operating system you have, how up to date it is, and also the type of um, the version of Ableton Live that you have. So that's something that I would strongly recommend Googling and checking out as well. Um, Sam, great question. Uh, do MacBooks become outdated? Absolutely, MacBooks always become outdated. Um, if anything, I think the something that maybe is less prone to getting uh, outdated is um, the idea of trying to stay in touch with the world. <laughs> um, and I don't mean that in, in you know, a, a, I, I guess I, I do mean it in a, in a very straightforward sort of, of manner. I think technology is always changing. Uh, that's the only thing that's constant. It's, it's going to keep on changing. Things are going to get outdated. Um, if you have a 2010 Mac, a 2000 MacBook, because I, I know this because I have one professor who does have one, um, it's not going to be able to run Live 10. Uh, and it, maybe it can't even run Live 8. So you want to be careful about what exactly you're doing. Things will always become outdated. The only thing that we can do as musicians and music technologists is to keep uh, aware of things that are being outdated. Uh, and does Apple throttle, throttle older MacBooks? It really depends on, on the situation. Um, I did used to work for Apple, but I can't speak for them <laughs> necessarily in an all-encompassing fashion. So I would strongly recommend doing a little bit of research too. If anything, I found that being, you know, taking initiative and wanting to find out more is a really good first step too about keeping up to date and finding out whether certain kinds of software support certain things. And oftentimes when you do a quick search, not even through Google, but maybe even searching on the direct Apple website as well, they give you some really wonderful information about compatibility issues. One thing I wanted to say while finishing off everyone is because we're about to end at the moment is um, thank you all for tuning in. We have a very exciting giveaway this week for a $200 Ableton voucher. So if you do want to be entered, please enter your information into the, uh, the link that maybe Thomas has put up in the chat. I forget. Sorry, Thomas. Yeah, cool. So, so Thomas already mentioned that earlier on in the chat, everyone. So if you scroll on up, he's provided some really useful information about uh, entering to win an Ableton voucher. And it's $200 for the web shop, I believe. So please 
uh, go ahead and enter. We want you to win. We want to make sure that you get this voucher. So please enter. <laughs> and thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, please subscribe to the uh, 343 Labs YouTube channel if you want to be updated for the rest of the streams we have. We stream every day at 1 p.m. Eastern time in the United States. I also have my own YouTube channel under my artist project that's called Daltrix. So that's in lowercase letters, D-O-L-L-T-R exclamation point C-K. Uh, I keep my artist up quite separate from my educational stuff. So over here, when I'm teaching, whenever I'm teaching, I go by Claire, but whenever I do my artist stuff, I go by Daltrick. But I also post content there on my YouTube channel too. So if you wanna head over there and follow me, you are most welcome to as well. I'm currently doing a daily series where um, I cover a, a small tip or a trick it's, it's, it's called a trick a day. So I share a little trick every day about something that's related to anything related to music tech. So I do some logic tricks as well. Um, I do some push tricks with Ableton Push. So yeah, feel free to head over there if you want to say hi in a, a different vein of stuff. Uh, thanks, everyone. And yes, answering Mick one more time. So it's doll trick, as I mentioned, in all lowercase letters with the exclamation point. So I'll probably say that, like, you know, I'll keep saying that for the rest of my life. But yeah, it's D-O-L-L-T-R exclamation point, CK, in all lowercase letters, which is exactly how my name is spelt. And sometimes we kind of miss like how people spell things, but yeah, it's spelt like that for a reason. Um, and yeah, you are more than welcome exempt. I think like after a while, <laughs> maybe a few of us get more used to being able to to you know say artist names in a certain way. So yeah, let's uh, let's see each other again next week. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in and uh, tune in tomorrow. Yeah, you're, you're going to see exactly what's here tomorrow. We've got the amazing Peter from Sensel, and you'll see the, the end screen for this. But tune in tomorrow for Teacher Talks, and I will see all of you next week. Bye! Broken skin has become
night. Broken skin has become.